Hey, this is Levi Lusco, and I wanted to talk to you just for a minute about something I'm so passionate about, and that's Fresh Life's brand new Leadership College. Even saying that excites me. Fresh Life Leadership College. Maybe this is something that God would call you to be a part of. It all kicks off August 21st. That's the first semester of this opportunity to continue your education or begin your college education all surrounded by not only the beauty of Montana, but also what God's doing at Fresh Life Church, a chance to be a part of ministry hands-on and pursue a degree that would help you out in either a marketplace or a ministry type position down the road. We sure would love to have you. The deadline to sign up and apply is August 2nd, and you can get more information at freshlife.church slash college. Because of our partnership with Southeastern University, these degrees that we're able to offer are accredited, and we would love to have you come be a part of all that God is doing here at the church. Check it out. What an honor it is to be here at Fresh Life. You can be seated. I want to welcome Salt Lake City and Billings and a special shout out to Deer Lodge and Church Online. What, what an honor it is um, to be here. Pastor Levi and Jenny, I am telling you their entire family are so revered everywhere I go. And do you know that I intentionally tried to weave a Levi quote into so many of my messages? As a matter of fact, just my message I, I spoke two days ago, I got in two Levi quotes in one message, right? And so um, not only are they amazing pastors, but behind the scenes, they are two of the most incredible friends that my family and I just consider it an honor to have. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, what a blessing. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, which means I go to Elevation Church. Pastor Stephen and Holly say hello. I would love to start out by reading some scripture from Revelation. Maybe you haven't stuck your toes over into the Revelation in a while, but today for our summer series, we are going there. Revelation 21, starting in verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That is such a beautiful vision for one day. But what about today? You see, I think many of you walked in today carrying with you some disappointments, some heartbreak, some desire that maybe the speaker will say the thing that you've been desperate for your husband to hear, for your wife to hear, your child to hear, your friend to hear, and you've come in with this desperation, but I want you to let God speak to your heart, not their heart, but your heart. Because I'm a big believer that God has arranged all of eternity to make sure we were here today. And so why don't we, for just the next few minutes, let the Lord speak to us about our disappointments. Today, I wanna to unpack for you two things, really. Where does disappointment come from and what do we do about it? My pastor, Stephen Furtick, said in a recent sermon, what God uses to develop your faith is disappointment. But what the devil will use to try to destroy your faith is 
disappointment. You see, disappointment can go in either direction, and disappointment is always on a scale, isn't it? Like maybe your worst disappointment today is that you went through the coffee drive through line and they frappéed your latte and waylaid your whole day, right? <laughs> and you're like, that's okay, you know, I'm gonna just put a little Jesus on it and I'm just gonna be okay with this disappointment. But sometimes disappointment ranges all the way to a complete devastation or maybe even all the way to a disillusionment where your life doesn't look anything like you thought it would. The title of my message, which is also the title of my latest book, it's not supposed to be this way. And I think if we're honest, all of us have said that at some point. I would suspect I could pass around the microphone today and we could all share that we've just been through some stuff, we're in the middle of some stuff, or we're about to head toward being in some stuff, right? And you go, well, that's not very positive. No, I'm positive. We've either just been through some stuff, we're in the middle of some stuff, or we are headed to be in some stuff not too far away. So the first question is, where does disappointment come from? Well, let's go all the way back to Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and let's start in Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 5. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent the rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man, everyone say a man, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in east in Eden and there he put the man he had formed. Then the Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and trees that were good for food. In the middle of the garden, there were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And I'm convinced at this point that the man did not write the one rule down. Because right after that, the Lord God says, whoo, it is not good for the man to be alone. And therefore, I will make a suitable helper for him. And women have been making lists for their men ever since. <laughs> Just reading scripture. Okay. So then it goes on to say that the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. But the scriptures also make it clear that from all that was created with these animals, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, he closed up that place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man and the man said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man my good friend Levi Lesko uh, I've heard him say that that really means she had apple bottom jeans and boots with the fur but <laughs> In all my study of Hebrew, I cannot find that. So obviously Levi is smarter than me, right? This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And then one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. You see, Adam and his wife could stand there physically naked, but also emotionally naked, they, they, they were spiritually naked. They could stand there in front of each other and in front of God, and they had no shame because they had no other opinion to contend with but the absolute love of God himself. So I wish 
that this right here was still the state of where we were, right? But this is not where the story ends. Genesis 3, we find at the very beginning of the very next chapter that there is a serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say? And don't you wish at this point that the woman would have said, if you're so interested in what God has to say, go ask him yourself, right? But watch what the enemy does here. Because I think in just this very first connection that we read that the woman is having with the enemy, I want you to watch what the enemy does because the enemy is still trying to do this to us today. First of all, he wants her to question God's word. Did God really say the enemy would love for us to question God's word too. He would love for us to believe two pervasive lies that have probably snuck into some part of your Bible reading before or your church attending, and that is this. The Bible is too hard to understand, and the Bible is too difficult to live out. And you see, if the enemy can get us to start to back away from God's word, he can get us to back away from God's instruction. And when we back away from God's instruction, we start to back away from being able to discern what we need to discern to really be able to make it through this life. The enemy would love to keep us isolated because when we are in isolation, the enemy can influence us. So, that's the first thing that the enemy is doing, making her question God's word. Did God really say? And then he quotes God. Now, I want you to pay special attention to the first three words that he says God said, and that is, you must not. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Do you see how restrictive he wants us to believe that God is? When in fact, what are the first three words that are recorded in Genesis 2 when God speaks to the man? The first three words that are recorded in my Bible say that God says not you must not, but God says you are free. We serve a God of freedom who gives us... We serve this God of freedom who gives us some restriction, but it's for our protection. Another great Pastor Levi quote, he says that when we hear God say, do not, we really should interpret it, do not hurt yourself, right? I love that, and I think about that so much now. Pastor Levi, you have influenced my life in incredible ways, and you influence all who hear my messages because I love to quote you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so the enemy says to the woman, did God really say you must not, wanting us to believe that we serve a God that's too restrictive, when in reality, God is not withholding from us, right? He truly is protecting us. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what God said? No. God said you are free to eat from all the trees in the garden, just not this one tree. And the woman says to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, I don't know what happened here because this is strange to me. The woman has changed the rule. Actually, she's just added her own thoughts or opinions onto the end of the rule. But because the woman wasn't there when the original rule was given, this is the kind of stuff that messes me up as I study my Bible at my kitchen table, right? So then my brain goes, okay, so when the rule was given, the woman was not there, right? It was just the man. And so is there any possibility that God could have given the rule to the man and then by the time that the woman was created, you know, the man was like, whoa, man. And you know, your thoughts can just get tangled, right? Is there any way that the man gave the rule incorrectly to the woman? I don't know, I wasn't there. I have no idea. But I do know because I am a woman, I do know something about where I could have gone wrong here. Because as a woman, I'm not putting this on you. Salt Lake City, I'm not putting this on you, right? I'm not putting this on anybody but me. 
But because I am a woman, I know that women have a tendency sometimes to interpret what a man says or does with way more emotion than what he ever intended it, right? And so I just wonder if that could be possibly happening here. We must not even touch it or we will die, right? I don't know exactly what happened here, but it is very dangerous for us to add to God's word. God is very clear about that, right? And, and it's especially dangerous for us to take God's word and then add our opinion on it. People all the time, because I'm the president of a national ministry, Proverbs 31 Ministries, people are all the time reaching out to me and saying, Lisa, what is your opinion? And they want me to, to really create a statement that provides a lightning rod for them to attack me. I don't really think they're that interested in what my opinion is. But my standard answer is, why does my opinion matter when God's word is so very clear? So just take them back to the word, right? Don't add our opinions on top of God's word because that's where we can start to get in trouble. And you'll see in just a minute how this very thing got Eve in trouble. Remember, we will find out from the text in just a minute, her husband was standing right there. Adam was with her when all of this is happening. The woman then, it says, the, the, the serpent says to the woman, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, according to Genesis 127, she was made in the image of God. She was already as much like God as God intended her, for her to be, right? And so when he says this, he says it as if it would be a blessing to know the difference between good and evil. But let me just clearly state that when God said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't because God wanted to keep something from them. God was trying to protect them from the weight of the knowledge of evil. The weight of the knowledge of evil is the very thing that now when something happens, because we live on the other side of this decision that she's about to make that's going to introduce sin into the world, the knowledge of evil is the very thing that makes us question, why God? Why this? Why me? Why now? Why are there natural disasters? Why do some people struggle with anxiety or addictions? God, God, God why is it that, that some people struggle with infertility? And, and why is it sometimes that children die before their parents? God, God, God why? Why is there betrayal? Why is there abuse, right? God didn't bring those things into this existence. Sin brought those things. And we know about them, but God, remember, he instructed her, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For you don't know what the weight of that knowledge will do to you. But you know, sometimes we want what we want, you know? And so we will steer where we stare. And we will locate something and we will think, I've got to have that. And you know what the enemy loves to do to us? He loves to say to us, oh, well, you know, that might be wrong for everyone else, but you've been through so much in your life, you deserve it. Or, you know, that might be wrong for everyone else, but you're mature enough to handle it. So look what the woman does. She continues to fixate on the one thing God said, don't eat from this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. Now, whenever I've thought about this story, I thought, man, it's kind of unfair for God to put this tree in the middle of the garden. And, and, 
And it says when the woman looked at the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And so it makes me feel like why would God put this appealing tree right there and then say, don't eat from it? I mean, what if? What if the fruit was like brownie a la mode fruit, right? And, and, and maybe it was a certain time of the month for her and it's chocolate and how could she resist? Not, you know, how, how could she just back away? No, she has to have it. But then whenever we're reading scripture, we've got to take it and keep it in the context of the other scriptures around it. And, and you guys know, I already read from Genesis chapter two, a description of the other trees in the garden. Genesis two reminds us it wasn't just this tree that had fruit on it that was pleasing to the eye and good for food. All the trees in the garden had fruit on it that was pleasing to the eye and good for food. She was surrounded by the brownie a la mode fruit, right? But she located the one thing that God said no to. And she couldn't take her eyes off of it. For if she would have stopped looking at it, maybe she would have seen all the other options of God's amazing provision all around her. I wonder what provision is all around us that we walk past every single day And we're so epically disappointed because we're just staring at this one thing, how it must break God's heart when we refuse to be thankful for what he has given us instead of disappointed in the one thing that we've located that he knows. If you do this, you don't know the weight of that. And that weight on you is the very reason I've said no to you about this. So the woman takes some and she eats it. Now don't miss this. Remember I said that Eve added onto God's rule. We must not even touch it or we will die. And you know, sometimes as women, we say things with such enthusiasm that even if someone didn't think it was true before, the way that we say it, they think it might be true now, right? And so think about this. She takes some, she touches it and she doesn't die. That was the part she added though. And I think that may have been what gave her the courage to eat it and then give some to her husband who was with her. And did you ever notice that nothing has happened yet? Because God gave the rule to the man. And so when the woman messed up, there's no indication that anything has happened yet. But when, she, when, he, when Adam sees her touch it and not die and eat it and not die, then he takes some and only when he eats it does the scripture say then the eyes of both of them were open and they realize they are naked and they cover themselves and they hide. I wonder what that moment was like really, you know? It's like, did they look down and go, shocking? Or did they look across and go, oh no bro, you gotta cover all that up. Like here's you a fig and a leaf, right? Because they're physically naked and their awareness of their, of their bodies has suddenly come about. And remember, there's something that's happening here. Why would they cover? Why would they hide? Why would they do that? because they're not alone. Remember, the enemy is there. And the enemy loves to follow this pattern. He locates something that we're disappointed in. He handcrafts a temptation just for us. He convinces us with all his might that that temptation is okay. After the temptation that, that, that he's putting in front of us, then we have deception. He's always gonna lie to us. He wants to keep the consequences hidden from us. And then after we sin comes the accusation. And that's exactly what he's doing to them right now. They are covering, they're hiding, they are desperate and they run away. And then God comes and asks them two questions. I I, I remember reading this story and thinking, think of all the stuff that God could have surely said to them. Think of what they have unleashed, sin, that that causes this epic nature of separation from God. That, 
that has introduced the knowledge of evil into the world and the decaying process that sin creates. God wasn't just looking at them, God was looking at humanity of all time. That very thing in your life that has broken your heart and has devastated you. God could see it. So think of all he would have been so justified in saying to Adam and Eve. And instead I find God asking two questions. And maybe he's asking us those same two questions. Number one, where are you? Where are you? Now, their physical location was not a mystery to God. When God comes walking, the sound of the Lord comes in the cool of the day of this garden, right? And it used to be such a welcome sound. Like Adam and Eve, I would imagine they used to hear the sound and think, Daddy's home, and they come running, right? But not on this day, no. And so God comes and says, where are you? Now, he knows where Adam and Eve are, but the thing is, Adam and Eve, they've lost their spiritual orientation. And I wonder if the sound of God's voice was like a beacon in the darkest night where God's saying, I'm here, but you're not. Come out of your place of hiding. Come to me. And isn't that kind of the epic nature of God even today? Come to me me. Have you ever woken up in a funk though, like a really bad funk, and you know all the Christian things you should do, get up, read your Bible, be nice, don't cuss, listen to Christian music, like you got the list down, right? But you get up instead and you're like, nah, I'm just going to scroll through Instagram for a minute because I think it'll make me feel better. And so you start scrolling and all of a sudden like everybody else's house is better decorated than yours. Everybody else's kid is more talented than yours. Everybody else's thighs look smaller than yours. And then your two best friends went out last night and didn't even invite you. What? And, and suddenly now my funk has multiplied. And I just imagine in that moment, God saying, where are you, Lisa? You need to get off of Facebook and get your face in my book because that is where real help is found. The second question that God asked is, who told you you were naked? You see, all of us at some point, I think we've had other people speak a line to us that then becomes a lie that we start to believe. Maybe we carry that lie with us for quite a while and the weight of it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And then over time, it just be, kind of becomes a label that we put over ourselves. And then that label becomes a liability in all our future relationships, right? And and I think we can all find places where we've allowed someone else's words to become the words of our story. And, and then when somebody bumps into your happy today and you have a completely out of proportion reaction to the offense at hand, it's usually not really just because they've bumped into your happy, it's because you've unleashed on them this hurt and pain that you've carried all the way back from this line that became a lie, that became a label, and now it's become a liability. I believe God wants to say to us today, we cannot let their words become the words of our story. We must let God's words become the words of the story of our lives. And then after God asks those two questions, he then gives out consequences because sin always comes as a package deal with consequences. And then in Genesis 3, 21 through 24, it says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them with apologies to the animal activists. Animals were harmed in the making of this story. Because how do you get garments of skin? The animal has to be sacrificed and blood will be shed. And, and isn't this such a, an appropriate picture that not only does sin always have a consequence, but de sin demands a sacrifice. And on this day, it would be the blood of the animal that dripped because of the sin. But one day, it would be the blood of his son, Jesus, that would drip from a cross. It's a pointing that yes, sin has come, but God is here and he has a plan through his son. Jesus. 
And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banishes him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. And he drove the man out. And I used to read that and think, God banishes them. When could God possibly banish me? But you see, the original meaning of that word banish is actually sent out. And it's actually not an act of cruelty. It's an act of great mercy. Because look at the text. God says, I cannot leave them in the garden. There are two trees in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were not supposed to eat from. But now that they have, sin has entered in. There's another tree in the middle of the garden. They were allowed to eat from the tree of life. To eat from the tree of life would perpetuate them for eternity. But now that sin has entered in, God said, I can not leave you here because you and your sin have separated from God. So therefore, you cannot reach out and eat from the tree of life now and be stuck in this state forever. So God sends them out and gives them a gift that will feel like nothing like a gift at all. He will allow their physical body to die so that through the process of salvation, their heavenly body can be made new and brought into existence. And through the miracle of redemption, God will then be united to them once again. And so God must send them out. So I read at the beginning about how revelation is where everything is promised that it will all be brand new. And if we go back to Revelation, I want to show you something that I think is pretty amazing. You see, we just left the Garden of Eden. Now the man is being sent out. But the very last chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, is called Eden Restored. The Bible begins in the Garden of Eden, and it will end in Eden. And Revelation 22, 3 says, no longer will there be any curse. And so this is what this helps me understand. You see, we live with the anxiety from the first Garden of Eden where there was perfection. But then we were sent out, Adam and Eve were sent out. They don't live in that perfection anymore. And there's the anticipation that perfection will return. The Garden of Eden will be restored. But right now, we're doing life between two gardens where there is no perfection, right? We think we can find perfection on this earth, but we cannot. And we chase it and we try to find it. We snap pictures and we crop them and we filter them and we edit them and we post them, hoping that this was finally our one time that we captured perfection. But you see, the only answer for the perfection that our heart craves, because the human heart was created in the context of perfection, and when he sent Adam and Eve out, perfection was still etched on the DNA of the human soul. So it's no wonder that we crave it. But again, this was not an act of cruelty by God. This was an act of great mercy. Because there is nothing on this earth that satisfies our perfection. That's what gives us our craving for God himself. And he is the one perfect match for the perfection that we long for our whole lives, right? This is where disappointment comes from. This is it, you guys. There is no perfection on this earth. But praise God, because if lesser loves ever satisfied us, we would have no need for God himself. But the second thing I promised is not only to tell you where does disappointment come from, but in the last few minutes, I want to show you what we're to do about it. There's another garden in scripture. I call it the middle garden. It's Jesus's garden experience in Gethsemane. And it's right before Jesus goes to the cross, right before he is arrested, right after the last supper he has with his disciples. In Mark chapter 14, 
verse 32. They, Jesus and his disciples, went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Listen to these words of Jesus. There are no other words of Jesus I relate to more than this. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. I wonder if Jesus is saying to us, stay here and watch me. How I suffer in this life between two gardens. Going just a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba Father, he said, everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me. And isn't this exactly where our faith and our feelings come in conflict? When we know God could fix something, everything is possible for you, God. And yet God doesn't fix it in the timing that I want or in the way that I want. And I'm begging him to. Man, that's hard, isn't it? The past three years, my family and I, we have been through truly the most difficult season. Devastating, really. Disappointment all the way to disillusionment. Because in early 2016, I found out that my husband, my life partner, the father of my children, my husband of over 20 years, that he was being unfaithful. He'd gotten caught up in some addictions and it overtook his life. And the devastation and the disappointment had me in this place. God, everything's possible for you. Take this from me. Please, dear God, take this from me. But then I realized the verse doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't just say everything is possible for you, God, take this from me. He then says what I believe are nine of the most powerful, earth-shaking, hell-shattering, demon-quaking words. Yet, not what I will, but what you will, oh God. You see, this right here, my friend, this is what we're to do with our disappointment. What I'm tempted to do is run ahead and start making solutions of my own making and then try to hold God accountable to the way I think the story should go. But we serve a God who is to be trusted, not tamed. And so God says, I have a plan. I have a plan and there will be good that will come from this, but it may not make you feel good right away. And so that's where I have to trade my will, the way I think things should be done, for God's will, who always has a better way. My will for thy will, because I stand so confident that he will. God knows and he will. I thought that my husband and I were over. And I wish I could tell you that there was this awful discovery and then immediately that he repented and then immediately we were restored. That's not the way the story went. We were separated, didn't even live in the same house for two and a half years. And it was disappointment like many of you know, whether your story is the same as mine or completely different. It's when you think that there absolutely is no hope. That's where we were at. And so I remember writing this letter to my husband to tell him that things were over. And I said, you know, sometimes in life when things get broken, God glues the pieces back together and then his light and his love can shine through the cracked places and we all sing Kumbaya and that's awesome and Christians love that story, but that is not our story. We don't just have broken pieces. We are shattered to the point of dust and you cannot glue dust. But then I remembered this very story of Genesis, the very beginning, where out of all the ingredients in the world and God had access to them all, he chose dust 
as the very thing to pick up and breathe into and new life came about. Oh, my friends, I don't know what disappointments, devastations and disillusionments have entered into your reality. And I don't know where you are shattered to dust, but here's what I do know. With God, all things are possible. And with God, dust does not signify the end. I pulled that letter back out and I wrote this across the bottom of that letter. Dust does not signify an end. It often must be present for the brand new to begin. We serve a miracle working God.